Everybody, welcome to Trader Merlin Show. It is your Wednesday edition, an exciting Wednesday edition to say the late. Oh, wait, are we on Wednesday? What day? Are we? Yeah, we're on Wednesday edition. How, how would I yeah. not know it's not Wednesday? Um, today, we're going to talk about kind of the, the bigger picture items on the plate for us right now. We have some issues going on with our politicians, as always seems to be the case. And there's a big discussion about this debt ceiling that might not be raised and people freaking out that we could have a default for the U.S. economy. And that will be, uh, I guess, the cornerstone of our discussion today. For those who may not know, since 1960, there's been 78 separate debt ceiling raises, just to put it into perspective that this isn't something that's abnormal. It seems to happen all the time. That's right, 78 times since 1960, you've had the debt ceiling raised or some discussion about raising that debt ceiling. So here is our topic du jour. I tried to draw some, pol you know, have some politicians panicking, staring up the sky like, oh no, the sky is falling. So the question is, is this the sky falling or is this just a random kind of normal walk in the park that we're used to? The debt ceiling crisis with the ambassador of opportunity, Mr. John O'Donnell. John, how you doing, my friend? Doing great, Merlin. How are you? Great. Good to have you back on. We're getting on some regularity here. because those that may not know, I hosted a show for uh, nine years, 11 months, and 28 days we were like two days short of uh we were two days short of having um a, a full decade on that one but john used to come on every single friday and do more of a macroeconomic uh, austrian keynesian economics type of show so it was fun who knows now all of a sudden i think we're gonna get john on more more frequently as people love you on the program so love having you back oh that's good yeah uh, i i i noticed merlin um you're starting to adopt uh, the John O'Donnell haircut. Do you, do you know that? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just called receding. It's getting you're, shorter you're, and shorter. Thanks, John. Thanks for uh, it, thanks for uh, no, pointing that one out. Well, it's it's just a sign <laughs> of of superior intelligence because because grass doesn't grow on a busy street. Well, you know? well, I think that I call them power alleys. I think it's because I toss and turn when I sleep. It just kind of anyway. We'll move on from my hairstyle on today's show to the debt ceiling. So. I thought what might be interesting is we'll run through the debt ceiling discussion. I, I, in my mind, I see five possible outcomes for this. There might actually be six, but we'll, you know, one of them is kind of kind of iffy. But I thought what we would do is I'll present each one, then we'll kind of go through a discussion through it, and of course, if you love when the viewers discuss this as well, and then at the end we'll come up with which one do you think is the most probable. So. Right now, it seems to be a standoff between uh, McCarthy and Biden, and who knows if that'll ever get resolved. It always seems to be that pissing match between politicians. Uh, sure, it's not the Hatfields and McCoys. It, over the, it feels like it. God, it's just ridiculous. Like just and and one will say, "I refuse to do this until you give me this." I'm if I get that, then maybe I'll. How about what's just better for the people? Period. Just was what's anyway. Um, yeah. So regardless yeah. of your Democrat Republican, who cares? It's not important. Um, but the first op uh, option would be that they come to an agreement and they make a deal and we're, we can move past this issue. What do you think of that one to start with? Well, are, are we going to like listen to and macro all four and then we'll pick what we think is the best one? Or are we going to nitpick on each one of them as we go let's along? Let's nitpick on each one. Otherwise, I think we might lose track of all which right. one's which. So let's do the first one is going to be that they make a deal. Well, I'm going to I'm I'm going to say uh yes, they're going to make a deal. Uh but you and I aren't necessarily going to like it. But mm. they're going to make a deal. Okay. And, and I'll put a little put a little footnote on that and we can add some more color to that uh, when we when we finish. So you already we've had, we've got to the first one and John's already going, "Yep, they're going to make a deal." Well, let me tell you why. I've done my <laughs> okay. research. I well, I've done my research too. And it, but you know, but I'm I'm adapting your first one. You didn't say, are we going to like it? Will we be satisfied? Will right. we have a like, you know, all the, you know, the firecrackers go off and like the fourth. No, we're going to have a deal, but you're not going to like it. But I will, I'll talk about what it, I think it might be. But uh, here's why. In the last 106 sessions where this has been an issue, we have in 98 of the 106 sessions, we've uh, had a debate and we went ahead and raised the ceiling. So that's the compliment. You're 
your since 1960 mm-hmm. number. I went back and looked. It's 106 years, Merlin. Wow. And 98 percent, and 98 times out of 106. So that skews my probability and my bias. Right. On. Okay. Okay. So so we'll start off with that one. Uh, the second one is kind of a bit tricky. So it seems at this point, I don't know why I keep putting that wrong slide up. Uh, it seems at this point that you know McCarthy and Biden have this pissing match going back and forth, and it seems like that's going to be the holdup. So there's a discussion of the Democrats doing what's called uh, an end around, which they fill out a form called a discharge petition, which is a bill they bring to the House floor. They vote on it. And then that would, without approval from the Speaker of the House. So they could get around McCarthy here by doing that. But the belief is, look, it's Republican controlled. You have to have a majority. The Republicans aren't going to jump ship. So that seems like a ridiculous long shot to me that is probably very low probability. I think it's a very low probability, simply for what you said. Uh, you know, Republicans kind of have control of that of that situation, and they're going to back McCarthy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we did have, in some previous votes. We actually did have four dissent and vote uh, against. However, you never know which way it's going to go. It could happen. It could happen. <laughs> but that's a long shot. So I, I got that as our second option here. Uh, the end around, not probably not going to happen. The third one which in my mind seems the most logical because that seems like what they've done every single time is they just buy more time. They pass a bill to temporarily suspend the debt ceiling, kick the can down the road, and we revisit this in a year or six months or another two years. Uh, Actually, I think if we kick the can down the road, it might actually align with the budget, which I believe is going to be in September. Um, And of course, you know, all this really is being sparked because Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, who initially was saying that we would run out of money in September – Because of the lack of taxes being paid in right now, it's really low as far as income from taxes. She's saying what June 1st um, might be when we run out of money. So that that significantly speeds up the timeline here. So what do you think about kicking the can down the road? I think this is the highest probability uh, of all the four we're going to bring up is uh, that. And I think they're going to kick the can down the road about six months. Then we're going to be in, um, you know, news debate heaven for six months and they're going to fight like hell for what needs to get cut right out of the budget and uh you know the dems got their favorites the republicans got their favorites and we're going to have a lot of squabbles there's going to be give and take probably on both sides and then you and i are going to have this conversation again (laughs) which is are they going to raise the ceiling (laughs) but no they're going to kick it down the can down the road about, about six months i would be my expectation yep uh boss poopa here says no on number three boss i'd love to know why you don't think number three so and again this is all uh you know open for debate there's no right or wrong answer here it's just kind of saying these are the probabilities i'm looking at it as kind of like when i make a trade or, or when any of you make a trade you have all the different possible outcomes of that trade and you say i'll look at this factor and this factor and this factor and and we come up with an assessment based off our analysis that says this is the highest probability one um, John thinks that so far, number three is the highest probability, but Boss Poopa says, no, I want to, I would love to know why you believe, um, that number three wouldn't happen. All right. So let me go uh, to my number four. Here's where we go into kind of bizarro land. Option number four that I have is it's actually, there's two separate pieces here, but the first one would be that Biden orders the mint to make a coin that's worth, let's say, a trillion dollars, or it makes a few of them worth a trillion dollars, thus theoretically increasing money supply because you're not creating more money out of thin air. He takes that coin and he deposits it with the Federal Reserve and then starts drawing against that, using that as collateral and taking money out to pay all of our obligations based off that trillion dollar coin. First off, I'd love to have a trillion dollar coin. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, but you, you know, people here say that Bitcoin's worth nothing. Well, a, a coin that's minted out of nothing saying it's worth a trillion dollars is, is worse than even Bitcoin is going to possibly be. So um, what's your thoughts on a trillion dollar coin being minted by the president, put with the Federal Reserve, and then using that to draw against to pay all the bills and obligations of our government? Very low probability. That's been tossed around several times over several years. And it's never gotten to first base. And I think that's extremely low probability and rather bizarro uh, methodology, agree. if you ask me. It's, it's you know, I, and I think the government would really lose credibility. First of all, 
the impact of that would be outrageous. What would stop other central banks across the world from doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it I would, mean, it would happen right away. I think you'd immediately. Well, see it, 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 I, I think you'd have a humongous drop in the value of the dollar. I think you'd see other central banks copycat. Well, if the Fed can do it, we can do it at the EU, and we'll do it in China and everywhere else. And it might ignite hyperinflation. Yeah, that that would that's the big issue there. Is here we've been well, I say we. I haven't been doing squat, but our elected officials uh, and the central bank has been doing as much as they can. At least that's what they say to bring inflation under control. Right here we are now looking at you know five percent inflation, and okay, let's get it back down to two as their target. But if you all of a sudden start printing, minting trillion dollar coins, thus increasing the money supply by a trillion dollars at a clip. Uh, you're going to have a significant impact on increasing inflation because that's more dollars in circulation. So to me, uh, that would be a poor option, although it would be unorthodox. I haven't seen that kind of move been, being done before, but I think that the, the the damage from it could be pretty bad. Earl, is it any more inflationary than Biden's budget, proposed budget of a tr you know one and a half trillion dollar deficits uh, yeah. going forward? I mean, is this, I mean, you, you could you could raise rates all you want. But, you know, if you've got this uh, fiscal responsibility of massive deficit spending, uh, you're not going to get you're not going to get interest. You're not going to get inflation down very much. True. You know, if you really think about it, I mean, I mean, so you got you got uh, our Fed chairman attempting to reduce inflation and you, you, you got Democrats wanting to spend like a drunken sailor. Yeah. Matter of fact, I think that's a disservice to you, drunken sailors, because <laughs> at least at least they're spending their own money. There you go. Well, let me uh, in that in category number four, which has produced this this coin that's worth a trillion dollars. I wanted to to throw another piece out there since I I do like the Constitution. I think there is some some power in that Constitution that was written many 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 moons ago. The Fourteenth Amendment, paragraph four or section four, talks about the U.S. dollar and debt. And I wanted to bring this one up here real quick. I'll read it to you because some of you may not be able to see this one. Here you go. Let me make it bigger for you. Uh, the Fourteenth Amendment, section four, says the validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payments of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing the insurrection rebellion, shall not be questioned. I found that one kind of interesting because what it's basically saying is Biden can invoke the 14th Amendment here and say, I need this to for the debts. I need to do this no matter what, and you can't do anything about it. I've never seen the 14th Amendment invoked. Have you ever heard or seen it invoked? No. Yeah. I, I, to my knowledge, it never has been. Uh, but I'm, I'm not a constitutional scholar. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think it ever has. Yeah, this is one that I saw being thrown around, and I thought that's rather interesting because if push came to shove, he does technically have the right to say, I'll invoke the 14th Amendment, and then all of a sudden say, hey, I'll just do what I want with the money, which kind of flies in the face of having a debt ceiling in Congress anyway to, to vote on the well, debt I, ceiling. I think, the, I think the Supreme Court would have something to say about that. I mean, come on. I, I, yeah. I mean, we got to... We do have an actionable Supreme Court, and and I think they would probably have an opinion on for Mr. Biden to the attorneys to consider. Yeah, I don't I don't think it'll go that way, but it's just one of the options on there. So that's for the final one, which is the one that um, secretly uh, and this sounds horrible. This is really really bad, but I think it ties into our discussion that we had about the dollar losing its reserve currency status of the world uh, a couple weeks ago. The option number five would be probably the most damaging to the United States, to our economy, and be very, very bad. Therefore, I think it's the least likely option here, but that is that the U.S. defaults on its debt. What's your take there? I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I, I think it would be absolutely deplorable if we did. Uh, we're the leading economy in the world. Uh, you know, we lead the world in supposedly the moral defending against the moral hazard and uh i think it would be uh absolutely like sh i mean really shooting yourself in the foot i mean i i i can't conceive inconceivable in my opinion <laughs> well i mean if you think about trust you know when you and i had that discussion about what's going to replace a reserve currency in the world 
part of the reason that we have the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world is because of trust. That governments and other governments around the world trust that the U.S. is going to make good on its debt obligations. If we cease to make good on our debt obligations, trust goes out the window. And then I think the, it's a very real discussion of who's going to be the reserve currency of the world because the dollar will have now lost faith with so many other governments that hold the U.S. dollar. And uh, that could and, be the and, real catalyst for change. And dollar denominated assets. Think about all those petrodollars that are offshore and think about all those countries. Uh, I, was, I was listening to a podcast today of a, of a, of a Bitcoiner who travels around producing documentaries. And he was talking about going to Venezuela and he was talking about going to Colombia and going to South Africa. And he says, you know, when you, when you go into the market to shop for local goods, uh, they all have a, a price up in the, you know, the local currency, but they all want dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it. Uh, and there's, there's always a two tier price. There's the official price for the local currency. There's a black market price and then there's a price in dollars. So the dollar is the most desired, uh, fiat, uh, currency in the world, uh, for obvious reason. And, you know, for us to, to renege and not pay our bills, uh, can you imagine? I mean, it, something like that could create a war. I mean, that, that could really. I, I think I mean, if that were to happen, John, I mean, if, if there was, and it wouldn't be the default on everything, it would be a kind of sequential domino effect. But depending on how severe that default were to get on, on debt, you know, you're looking at 10% drop in the markets, daily lock limit downs for, for a little while. I mean, I think it would be yeah. very bad for our market. And a total collapse of the bond market and total collapse of the banking system. I mean, well, we're, we already started that one. <laughs> well, that, that would be part two, I guess. Or that would accelerate the decline. I mean, it would just chew through all the equity in the banking system of not only our banking system, but other banking systems across the world. So it's inconceivable in, in my mind. And how would you like Mr. Biden uh, for something like that to happen under his name? I Nobody mean, wants that. I don't care. Nobody. I mean, yeah, even, even even Trump wouldn't go for no. for that kind of stuff. No, there's there's not a, there's not a human being alive that would want to be at the helm when that happened because your name would be in history books for here on out uh, as being a complete f up. You know, a total oh, screw up. Well, which one are you favoring of the four you've brought up? Which I've told you what fate war and I'm leaning in favor of. Yeah, what, you what said you were leaning for number three, and and I think that if if again as a trader. Going through probability and just looking at what has been happening in the course of my lifetime, because I, I, I don't go back to the 60s and remember any debt ceiling stuff or anything like that, but just in my trading world career, it always seems that they, they buy more time, they do a temporary raise, and they just kick that can down the road. So I, I think yeah. the most logical option there is number three. To answer Tom's question, he said, how much would the federal government need to cut spending to avoid raising... Um, the, the credit limit um, or raise the debt ceiling. Well, I'm not 100% sure on that one, Tom, but I did find a really cool graphic here that kind of shows where that debt ceiling was and we can see how quickly those numbers have been exceeded. And this one's actually kind of old. You can see that it's, it was expected to have exceeded that red horizontal line here uh, in some time in late August. Well, now Janet Yellen says it's June 1st, which means that this whole thing has shifted up. We've blown through that cash like a rapper at a strip club, um, just gone. I mean, that cash has disappeared. So I don't know how much would need to be cut, but clearly there would have to be some cuts made to stay underneath the current debt ceiling. And, you know, this is where we look at the different administrations uh. and, and, you know, Republicans are generally about cuts, 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 and Democrats are about spend, 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 spend. And before you say, hey, well, screw the Democrats for spending, remember, Historically, markets perform better under Democrats because you spend more, stimulates the economy, stimulates growth. There's arguments to both sides here, but bottom line is we do need to rein in the spending. I mean, if any of us had this personal budget that our federal government has, we would have been bankrupt decades and decades ago. Is there anybody on this uh, podcast that can raise their hand and say with a straight face, there is a significant components of the government budget that that doesn't have either fraud or waste <laughs> or, or just incompetent gross incompetence that we can't cut what there's so much fat in so many of those budgets uh, there are plenty of places to cut the budget totally. and not reduce the quality of life nor go uh, uh, default on Social Security and Medicare and and that's not going to happen we're not going to default on Social Security and Medicare. They're either going to means test it 
are they're going to they're going to raise the taxes and uh, higher income people are going to pay higher taxes for a longer period of time. And uh, that's going to be the primary way. That's what we've always done. I don't see why it's going to be any different. Yeah. Yeah. I'm especially, especially for the boomer generation. Now, for, for, you know, for the millennials, that may be another story because there's a legitimate debate on is there, you know, are the boomers going to exhaust Social Security and Medicare? Uh, capital funds because there is no real money in the budget. Both those budgets are bankrupt, you yeah, know. Yeah, I agree. And, and I'm with you. I think that, you know, those, uh, th there's a lot of places to go and cut budgets. Unfortunately, you know, that would, you, uh, if, as soon as you go and start cutting, which I agree, there's, there's tons and tons of places to cut, you'll get the other side of the aisle raising up saying, hey, you know what, well, this is unemployment. Now you're just creating a worse financial position for the economy and yeah. people are losing jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then you also have to go in there with a, a really keen eye. You know, it'd have to be someone who's trained and understands those different departments and businesses to say, okay, these people got to go. And if you look at something like, uh, look at Facebook. Look at what Google did recently. Uh, a lot of these tech companies did massive yeah. hiring, right? Brought in thousands of new employees because money was yeah. cheap, economy was robust. All right. All and right. then when things get tight, they're like, okay, well, we don't need this whole department anymore. You can go. We don't need 15 of these people. Let's keep two of them. Let's get rid of the 13 that suck. And, and unfortunately, that and I, I, that doesn't happen in government. No, it doesn't happen in government, and it needs to happen in government. And we need, you know, where we need AI and, and where we need to trim our sails is to, um, you know, get rid of some of these gross pension plans for government workers at the state and federal level. Well, I mean, you know, you know now, see, now you're, now you're playing with fire because you say get rid of a pension plan. Remember, a lot of these people have worked hard no, their life for that pension plan, and but they, they've they earned can, it. But, but how many... How many people believe you're supposed to pay a sheriff in the middle of uh, California $250,000 a year in pension money? No, I'm saying trim the pensions. I'm not saying abolish them. Yeah. I'm saying get them to be a reasonable number. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what that reasonable number is. I haven't done a study on it, but how many, how many, I, I remember there was a basketball coach with, I was close to at the University of California in Irvine back when I lived in Irvine. And, uh, the University of California system has a, 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 a pension payment based on the moving average of your salary the last three years of your employment. So what most people do to scam that system uh, is they go in and they, they everybody has modest salaries, but the last three years or as you get closer to retirement, they bump up your salary automatically. I mean, it's kind of each... I mean, in almost every department, they do this. It wasn't just a basketball coach. Yeah. And and so that when you do retire, you're getting, they bumped another 20% on your pension payout. Well, that's kind of scamming the system, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Tom, Tom brings up a good point, and this is a good one. He says, uh, you know, Twitter cut 80% of their staff and is running better and collecting revenue for blue check marks. Yeah, maybe we should bring Elon Musk as the government watchdog to go through each de agency department and just figure out who needs to stay and who needs uh, to go. I, <laughs> I, I would I, I would vote for Elon in a heartbeat as president and come in or, the, you know, or, or chief budget officer. Yeah, he can't be president, in. John. He can't be president. Why not? He was born in South Africa. Well, they will make an exception. Yeah, <laughs> we would. I think people are ready to make an exception oh. for Arnold Schwarzenegger, but no, you were born in <laughs> Austria. You can't do it. So, and and it really it really pains me to say that because that means I could never run for president. I just it really hurts me. I, that was my goal. I was going to run for president. If an actor can do it, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, well, but I'll 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 put forward something to amend the Constitution that Merlin can run for president. I would not want that. I, although I think it would be good to, uh, I would like to By see the, someone in president in in the office of president who really is just doesn't really care about you know excessive wealth. It's just I want to have enough to be happy and comfortable with. And now let me do good for the country. Let me do good for the people. And I just feel like there's so much crony capitalism and. Uh, you know, people who go into office with wide-eyed intentions, and then all of a sudden they get caught up in the the corruption of it, and and the lobbyist, and they they you know making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and all of a sudden they've got ten million dollars in their accounts. Like, well, how did that come to be? You know, there's a lot of garbage in politics. Anyway, 
Merlin, when, when your crypto position uh, in aggregate becomes worth, say, $5 million, are you willing to take the Gates and Buffett pledge to give away 50% of it? If I, of my, of my money, sure. Yeah. Are you willing to give, take right now in front of God and all the, the, the you know, the YouTube viewers, you're going to give away half your net worth to charity? At the end? Sure. No. Well, we don't have to be at the end. Let's assume it gets, when it gets to the $5 million mark and net aggregate value. I, I would be okay with that. Um, as long as the charities that I believed in, and I would actually, I would probably, yeah, yeah. I would probably, hold on, I would probably start my own charity because honestly, I think most charities are scams. I think most charities, you donate a whole bunch of money and 10 cents on the dollar goes to the end goal. I want to see like 95% of it go to the end recipient. So yeah, I would probably start my own charity and I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what Bill Gates did. Yep. Right. Uh, Buffett started a charity for his son and gave a bunch of money to his son. Uh, who's an agriculturalist, by the way. Let's see. There is no incentive to cut government. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I, we, I think, Big Ed, we see it as a necessary thing to cut it and streamline as any business. You know, you look at, if you look at the government as a business, and it's probably the second largest business in the world, I would argue that the church is probably the biggest business in the world. The government is going to be number two. Um, and then you've got the financial system is going to be number three. It's about expenses. You know, everybody that runs a business needs to know your income, your expenses, your liabilities, and where it's all being made. Government is the only one of that group that just doesn't seem to care about their expenses because they have the printing press and can keep printing more and more and more and more and more. That's the problem. The church. That would be an interesting <laughs> conversation. I assume you mean the Catholic church right, when you say the church. Is that correct? Or you mean all of religion? I think I think that a large part of religions are business. I think there's you know obviously faith goes a long long way, but I think a lot a lot of cause now I'm, now you're going to polarize. I'm going to lose fifty percent of my audience today because they're like you're a hater. I'm not a hater. I just think that churches are a business. They, they, there's money involved there to keep the church going. So yeah, I think it's a business. Well, they don't pay taxes, so if they're a business, they have to pay a tax. If they're a nonprofit, uh, with business divisions and business-like behaviors because they run great operating margins for all practical purposes. Yes, they do. But there's but there's the case where if they have surplus income, many of them, I, mean, I know, good. you know, well, it goes to, to the good of, of the charitable cause. Right. Uh, you know, think about it. <laughs> Margaret says John Alston is. Yeah, that guy. But would you say he's a good one or a bad one, Margaret? So there's, there's a lot of people in the in that space. You know, you have some very good people, and I think you have some people that abuse the system. But let's not make this a show about religion. I'm going to get myself right. into trouble here. <laughs> All right. I so uh, number one on this, uh, for your perspective, was buy more time, uh, pass the bill, temporarily suspend it, raise it, and kick it down the road. My guess is it'll probably be for September would be the, the target for the next can kicking. Seem about right? Yeah, six months, six or six you know, six, eight months. I mean, uh, depends on how long they want to argue. I mean, uh, and who, 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 as they start to argue over this budget, I mean, um, you know, it looks like Biden wants to dig in his feet. He has the, he has his uh, backing. Yep. Um, his pretty strong backing. They did pretty well in the last election. So I don't know. You know, the other thing that's interesting in this is, Obviously, when you have a, a deficit, in this case, the debt ceiling needs to be raised because they're just spending way too much money. You know, you talked earlier about, you know, Biden's new proposal to tax crypto miners. And in, in, in a situation like this, when you're looking for a way to generate more income, it does open up the door to that specific political party to lash out and just say, OK, what can I tax? Right. Can, can I tax drinking fountains? You know, can I, what, what do I get? Do I, do I get tax recess in elementary school? What can I tax? And it just seemed like a logical target here was going after crypto mining companies because of energy usage and their, you know, their carbon footprint. The irony is the vast majority of crypto miners now are using alternative energies, wind and, and um, runoff from uh, yeah. uh, oil drilling operations. But what's your take on Biden's attack on miners? I think it's absolutely ridiculous. First of all, the aggregate use in the mining, Bitcoin specific mining industry, it's the equivalent of uh, Christmas tree lights on an annualized basis. Mm -hmm. If you look at the total kilowatts that are consumed across the world, it's the equivalent of Christmas tree lights. It's a very small amount. 
Now, uh, the grids are getting a lot greener. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing a better job of integrating wind and solar in, into the total composite uh, input for the production of electricity. But it's also probably, and I'm trying to look this up, it's probably unconstitutional mm. uh, to, do, to do something like this over and above the energy situation. But if you take the time, the Bitcoin miners have been extremely good for the grid uh, in in Texas so far. And, uh, and and they're getting because, a lot of support down there, too. I mean, Ted Cruz, is, it, Ted Cruz is an interview where he's saying, uh, I, I buy, I think he said every week or every month, he's buying more and more Bitcoin. He's totally pro Bitcoin and he's, you know, pushing to keep miners there. You know, they've done a lot for Texas from a tax revenue perspective well, and job creation. Well, other than the, the ESG situations on, if you do some research on that, you're going to discover it's, it's very, very little. But let me read this blog that just came out, which put me in a new direction. Okay. As applied to Bitcoin proof of work, the Dame tax would violate the First Amendment. This is because proof of work miners are publishers that timestamp transactions and express data, collectively writing on an immutable record of information. Energy is a universally accessible input that is consumed in that process of publishing. The Supreme Court has held that taxes on publishing inputs like ink and paper violate the First Amendment, especially when they are based on the content of the speech being published. Hmm. And I'll, I'll send you a copy of this article, but they go into a great white paper written on why Bitcoin mining is about free speech. Interesting. Uh, and it's very interesting, over and above the ESG argument. So, uh, so I'll send this to you. It, it, it might be worth doing a whole show on it one day because it's it's very very important uh, to the development. And and if if they're going to put this tax, and what they're proposing is a thirty percent tax, the first year will be be ten percent, the second year twenty percent. The third year, they're not even taxing the hydrocarbon. They're not even making an assumption that wind and solar have become a significant part of the grid, uh, where aggregate where Bitcoin mining is aggregating, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's been extremely political to the balance in the grid uh, and, and 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 the efficiency of the grid. So Bitcoin mining is very important. Uh, to both the production and distribution of electricity to to the home and to commercial enterprises yeah. that that the ESG people don't even want to have a conversation about. Uh, I'm there have been you know the New York Times wrote a, a scandalous article that was full of error and data on how much energy is really consumed by the Bitcoin mining situation right. and. Uh, and if, if, if they chase, if they do something like this, the number one input for Bitcoin mining is the cost of electricity. And so if, if they're going to go down this route, they're going to chase Bitcoin mining out of this country, which means, you know, the miners are going to pack up their rigs and they're going to move to another country where, the, where they don't have this political windage. And I really think it's all about, I don't think Biden supports uh, the crypto industry, number one. I think his administration. I think that's as clear. That's 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 as clear as the sun coming up in the day. I mean, it, there's a lot of articles the, right now called um, Operation um, Choke Point. Choke Point. Right, and this choke is Choke Point, point Two. Yeah. Choke Point Two. Point I am. And so I don't think the Biden administration at all is friendly toward the crypto industry, specifically Bitcoin. And if, what they're going to do is, you know, the Coinbase is opening up a, a futures exchange yeah. in Bermuda. Uh, they're just going to chase the industry offshore. But Bitcoin mining will go on. You're not going to kill Bitcoin mining. Nope. The question will be, can they chase them out of Texas? You know, if, like the state of Texas, I guess, could turn around and say, well, screw you. We're going to turn around and give you a state tax credit if you're a bitcoin miner and exempt your taxation completely <laughs> and they'll offset it i mean you know so you know the states are going to have to stand up that they want bitcoin mining in their state to make their grids uh, more uh, not uh, more non-fragile they need bitcoin mining yeah and uh now 
you know, I have nothing against Christmas tree lights. I don't want to outlaw Christmas tree lights, and I don't want to cut back or tax the American homeowner on the use of for Christmas tree lights. But I, I think <laughs> tax Christmas tree lights. There we go. We need tax more Christmas tree lights. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. So you know, uh, um, and this again is government picking winners and losers. Why do you handpick a, a, a particular industry? Well, I you know. Uh, you know, space travel burn puts a lot of hydrocarbons. You know, you, you look how much. So let's tax. You know, uh, go into the moon. How much energy do we hydrocarbons do we put go into the moon or something? I mean, it's ridiculous. So I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm not loving Biden at all for this particular move. Huh. And I don't think it's him. I think it's his staff that put these ideas in his head, and he just rubber stamps them. Yeah, I, I don't think. I mean, I don't. I don't think he knows a. Bitcoin for the man in the moon. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he doesn't understand it. Um, Michael asked a question. Just kind of curious if you have a thought on it. I know you you probably look at a few of these miners. Michael says, "Which are the best Bitcoin miners to invest in?" You got any any um, any I thought got, on that one? I used to have one favorite. Now I have two. Okay. Uh, um, uh, there's some, there's probably a half a dozen of them that are probably pretty good. But if you look at the amount of Bitcoin to produce, if you look at the number of rigs. Plus their cost of, of their you know capex investment in rigs, their location for affordable energy with good local politics. I, I like I Riot. It. Riot, yep. I like Riot. Based out and of I Texas. Like, yeah, and, and uh, I like Marathon Digital. Uh, those are my top two. There's probably a half dozen of them that are pretty good, but those are my top two. And um, I used to be in Marathon's camp, but now I just I put. Every time I decide I want to own, and I have a substantial position in miners, I if I want to add to those positions, I just take fifty percent and put it in each and be happy, you know. Yep. Uh, so for Michael, but, Riot, uh, but, but if, you, if you take a look at what Riot, how Riot has performed since January, oh yeah, and you, if you pull up uh, a year to date, how Marathon's performed, they've done both spectacularly well, but Riot's actually done better. Yeah, and I and I think a lot of that, as you mentioned, has to do with their their cost of energy where they're located. I mean, they kind of have a whole little cost city. of energy. What does their balance sheet look like? Riot has a cleaner balance sheet. Uh, where in the lo where they're located, do they have political favor? And you need that political favor. You need local political favor in your camp if you're going to start using that amount of electricity and then um what would they pay for the rigs and you know and are they efficiently you know using immersion to keep the rigs cool to be more efficiently in their use of electricity and are they uh and and riot is pretty strong i mean i they produced um and here what the miners are doing now is like for instance uh riot produced 600 bitcoins during the month of april and um did you, and uh, Marathon produced 700, but they sold 600 of the Bitcoin. But if you look at the balance sheet of uh, Marathon, they've got over 11,000 Bitcoins with no debt uh, uh, encumbering them on their balance sheet. Yeah, you know, one of the big issues was a lot of these miners were starting to sell their Bitcoin just to cover the cost of operations as Bitcoin tank. It's good to see them have a, a sizable portion of their balance sheets and not moving it to exchanges to offload it. So that's a very good sign as well. Uh, well if, when, 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 when Bitcoin moved from 15000 to 30000 that solved that problem pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, yeah. Uh, Koja has asked about what about Hive. Hive as well is in that space. I don't know the numbers of all them real well. If, I, what I would I'm say pretty, is for anybody who is who is thinking about the mining, you know, there's the two Bellwethers, Riot and Mara. Hive is certainly, I would probably put that number three. Uh, but you can go buy ETFs. There are some ETFs out there, although they're rather illiquid, and that might be a safer way to go just because of its diversification and not focusing on one specific mining company. So that might be an alternative. So I think WGMI, let me real quickly check that one out. WGMI, yeah, this is the Valkyrie Bitcoin Miners ETF, although it's it's very thinly traded. It only does about you know fifty yeah. to 100,000 shares a day. Plus, you're going to get diluted. But on The problem I have with that, strategy is you're going to get diluted by some of the the weaker miners now i do think there's going to be a consolidation in the mining space yep, i think the big efficient companies that can raise additional capital because you need a lot of capital to be in the mining business and um and you, you need the other winds I and mean, you need cheap electricity so that means you better find a local cheap source of electricity because you're not 
And, you know, the political winds in Washington, D.C. is not in favor of this industry right now. Yeah. But take a look at how they perform over the last year, over the last four months. Sure. Yeah, it's funny. I was funny because I did a show a while back where I was like, I am very bearish on the mining companies. And that was back in, in the end of last year. And the reason for it was the trend was just aggressively down and Bitcoin was falling. And it said, as soon as Bitcoin stabilizes and starts to rally back up, then these miners will right. do well. And, um, you know, we did see at the tail end of 2022, a couple of Bitcoin mining companies go bankrupt or sell their assets right. to other companies, therefore bolstering your consolidation argument. And uh, as Bitcoin keeps rallying, I don't think you need to worry too much about the consolidation. But if it starts to fall, uh, you may see some of these these miners merge together uh, and become more powerful. Uh, but, you know, like we're having a consolidation in the banking space right now, I, I don't think this consolidation is finished. I think we're going to have some more uh, pain. And uh, J.P. Morgan has obviously shown that uh, they have a model to acquire these assets on the cheap, on the cheap, cheap, cheap. And uh, <laughs> the government, in fact, pays – or excuse me, the FDIC uh, – pays uh, for, to have these banks taken over. And uh, there are going to be a bunch of other banks that are going to probably go through this. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I just hope on that topic, John, hold on real quick before we go there. Um, you know, you were talking before the show about PacW, which uh, guys might be the next shoe to drop. You think it's done. Jim Cramer says, oh, it's over. This is the last one. And then First Republic happens. He said First Republic's a great bank. Then First Republic goes under. Now he's saying, oh, it's done. No more. And now we see PacW, maybe the next shoe to drop. They're down 54% in after hour session right now, um, down trading at $2.91. Yeah, that's the you know what, the latest shoe. What what's your take on kind of this the regional bank meltdown that we're seeing? You think there's going to be a bunch more, or are we going to start to see it slow I, down here? Well, I think it's going to continue, but I think phase two is going to be the commercial loans, yeah, uh, and especially for office buildings and those kinds of things. And uh, but no, it's going to continue. How many banks took that same trade where they got you know they got mismatches and where they lit short and uh, excuse me uh, yeah lit short and borrowed long and, and got caught uh, also if we've got you know cockroaches never live alone they, they always have brothers and sisters and siblings so when you turn on the light in the night and you see all of a sudden cockroaches are going everywhere uh, there's going to be consolidation but you know we've already gone through consolidation several times Merlin. we used to be back in the 60s we had 14,000 banks today we have 4500 or 4300 so there's always already been significant consolidation geez in california i lived in california for 22 years i saw four or five banks that were gobbled up you remember first interstate bank or washington mutual or some of those uh mm -hmm. that were gobbled up you yeah. know well well wells fargo bought a lot of them well it's and funny if you look at the three that have gone under right now it, it eclipses all of the ones that have gone under and pretty much all the ones that went under in uh 2008 it just just set set, set the the stage for it and as michael put series says pack w is down and after i was trading other banks are following so, you know, I'll just show you a couple other big ones here. Let me scroll down to the banking sector because there's a few that are down huge in the after hour session. It, it looks like a lot of blood on the streets right now. Uh, Zion Bank Share is down about 12% after hour session. That's after 5% down for the day, down another 12% in after hours. Uh, even Charles Schwab getting hit. But here you have CMA, which is Comerica, another one that has a uh, large commercial mortgage exposure. They're down 11%. Uh, there were a few others. TFC down 5 And this is all aftermarket close. Um, WAL, right down 33% after hours. So there's going to be a lot more, guys. I think there's going to be a lot more you know, you know, the, one, the, the one that surprised me uh, of all of those, um, the one that surprised me the most was Schwab. Yeah, yeah. I, I was really surprised to see that. Now, I have an account at, um, uh, you know, Thinkorswim that's owned by Schwab. Right. But uh, I never, I never considered... And but you know when but when forty percent of your income on an annual basis comes from net interest margin, uh, yeah, you have to think of Schwab as a bank. Yep. I mean, when you really, and you know, we may see more of that. 
another thing it was looks like Merlin, if we have a recession, and I believe in the second half of this year, we have a much we're not out of the woods on having a recession. I, I still think, you know, we have some cards to play in that game. That will accelerate the banking situation. How many ba- how many loans are going to go bad in a banking crisis? It's going right. to cause the banks to become insolvent. So, yeah, it's going to it's going to accelerate takeovers. It's going to be accelerate. Some are just going to go bankrupt. Some aren't probably worth taking over. Their bank, you know, maybe they wrote a if you if you wrote uh, a bad uh, debt against the you know the uh, the Sears, what used to be called the Sears Tower in Chicago, do you really want to take possession of it in an environment where people don't want to work in high-rise co- commercial buildings? Right. No, agreed. You know, so, yeah, I, I think the, I think we got more to fall. I think we got several shoes to drop yet on this one. But what do you think? Do you think it's possibility of a recession second half of this year? I said on January first that I believe that we're the first quarter of this year. I thought we we're going to see positive. And I saw second, we'd slow down, and then third and fourth, we'd see the markets sell off. Um, I don't, I don't believe rather woods yet. And you know, this goes back to some of my mentors in the old trading floor days, where they were all, would always tell me, "Hey, when you get a rate hike, that that doesn't that doesn't impact the economy right away. It impacts the markets instantly because that's speculation. But for a seventy-five basis point rate hike to impact the bottom lines of companies like Apple and Microsoft and J.P. Morgan, Bank of America." It takes, you know, nine to 12 months for that to actually filter through. And we've been aggressively raising. So I I personally don't think that there's probably the last three or four hikes have not even impacted or come into the play yet. And that could start to hit the economy in the tail end of the year. So I'm bearish. I do think that the second half of the year, you're going to see markets sell off, I think, recession. But that's just Yeah, I'm not worried about those big brands. They're probably always going to be credit worthy. The ones I'm worried about. Uh, uh, are the little companies? Oh, your Bed uh, Bath and Beyond, John. You worried about your Bed Bath and Beyond? i been, been uh, yeah, those. <laughs> and I, I'm, not, I'm worried about the guy, you know, down the street that, uh, you know, you know, runs a a small dairy, and he wants to expand the dairy, and he wants to go to his local bank or maybe a regional bank, and he he doesn't pass the credit worthiness test for some reason, and it's primarily because of the bank's balance sheet and. So I'm worried about the little businesses, and they're laying off people too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm not. I'm not worried about Google and Apple and Microsoft. Uh, well, they'll, you know. they'll have some sell-off. I mean, again, you have you've got a few companies which have been the main catalyst for all the S and P's gains. So if those companies start to falter, oh, but, we can see some big right. downside move. Right. I'm. I'm. Yeah, correct. I, I. They'll see pressure on all the, especially those high PE stocks. Um, I'm worried about the streaming industry. I mean, that that's getting very congested too. I wouldn't doubt that the streaming wars is going to cause some consolidation in the entertainment space. Uh, you know, that very well could happen. I don't know which ones, but uh, Tom, Tom, really need- Tom asked a good question here. He says, uh, "What's the current definition of a recession?" So you you know those economic definitions way better than I follow them. I think they're all adapted to the current time and place. But what do you, what would you say is the definition of a recession right now? Well, a recession is when all your neighborhood businesses, uh, you start to see 20% of them go out of business. A depression is when you go out of business. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you got you to get to drift? That's the textbook definition right there. <laughs> that's the real, that's the John O'Donnell real world giant sucking chest wound definition. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I mean, I mean well, let's face it, Merlin. Uh, you, you and I know a company uh, that went through some pretty serious economic headwinds. Yeah. Caused by not caused by necessarily the market, uh, but caused by massive government intervention, and um, boom. Uh, yep. Yeah. Destroys <laughs> it very quickly. Yeah. Slow at first, and then. All of a sudden, boom! <laughs> so, how many other businesses could could the mining industry do that? Biden's work may force an acceleration in the mining consolidation space. It may force several small miners to get bigger quicker. Well, you know what's interesting is 
I think what you're going to get in the next election in 2024 is a lot of single issue voters. And, you know, I am I have a lot of platforms and issues that I think are very important to me. Um, but as I look out, there's there's this huge group, especially of the let's just say 25 to 40 year old men who are absolutely pounding the table for digital assets and things like that. And, and it's like for Elizabeth Warren and Biden to openly attack cryptocurrency and digital assets really makes me feel like you could see a pretty big shift in the voting interest uh, in 2024 because of just a simple stance on no crypto, right? Anti-crypto. And I think we'll see a big change happen in 2024 from a political uh, office to those who are unfriendly or from unfriendly to those who are more crypto and digital asset positive, which would be great for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm with you 100%. But we know that Biden will blame it on Trump. Of course. And then Trump will blame <laughs> it on Biden. It'll, it's always point the finger at some, the other person in, in politics. So that the, as long as you have a different uh, color to your, your title, that's it. You know, if you're, you're blue, then, oh, it's the red. If you're red, oh, it's the blue. That's it. It's clear cut. Um, you know, let's, next time, John, let's do a special on Bitcoin. I know that you, when I first talked to you about Bitcoin many, many moons ago, you're like, well, interesting. You know, of course, being an Austrian economics guy, I'm sure it was interesting to you. But you've since gone down the rabbit hole and, and you're, you're, you're kind of turned into a Robert Breedlove or a Michael Saylor out there with regards to your thoughts on Bitcoin. So I'd like to, to dig deep into what your beliefs are in Bitcoin, what it means to society, to the world. But that's a whole different show because we are out of time for today. Well, I'd like to do that, but then at some point in time, I don't know if you want to do it in a public forum or not, but you, you offered, I think last time we talked, uh, to try to get me to think a little more broadly and positively about, um, you know, the proof of stake coins. Okay. Uh, I won't call them all shit coins. No, but, uh, you can't. I mean, there's a lot of them that are actually doing legitimate business. So, absolutely. Uh, and and it, it, but it's, but I'm open to to you giving me um, uh, your uh, reason on why. Uh, first of all, I think we both agree. Uh, at least I, I maybe I shouldn't make this assumption, but right now Bitcoin's the king of the hill. Probability is may retain that position although there are some circumstances where it could be like the dollar get i think no the issue john is the there is no one hill right with crypto and digital assets there's many different hills so if you're looking at a store of value payment network bitcoin's king of the hill uh if you look at a decentralized ecosystem for businesses to develop and write smart contracts on uh, do almost infinite business operations Ethereum is the king of the hill, right? So there's there's different applications for digital assets, sure. and I think that's where I, you know you got you got to look at the look at them objectively and say, okay, this might not be proof of work technology, but is what Ethereum is doing, or Solana, or Avalanche, or you know Algorand, is what they're building. Does that represent a platform that the world can use as a business environment? And to me, that would be the one that's the king of the hill for for that space. I got it, I, and I, I I hear I hear where you're coming from. The question I would have that I would have to feel comfortable with, because in the breed led Michael Saylor rabbit hole, it's Bitcoin maximums That's to it. the hundred percent, yeah, hundred to the hundred and ten percent. Yeah, there's nothing else. No, there's nothing else. Uh, for a lot of good reasons, they have that opinion, sure. uh, but there are also uh, there are other reasons why uh, some of these proof of stake situations. And by the way, I guess i don't think that bitcoin could ever turn into proof of stake do you do you think i mean could the, it, the answer got, is yes it could it could but they, they'd never let it happen right the community would never let it happen the the bitcoin miners would never let that happen no way well the bitcoin miners could get you know if biden got his way he'd like to see the bitcoin miners go away the miners would just go somewhere else see with ethereum it was the community said this is in the best interest of the project it would not happen with bitcoin no way yeah, okay well, that being said, the only thing I have about all these other coins is, is, and I'm sure some of them have some great projects that they're working on. Yeah. My only condition is I think they should be registered as securities. If they're a security, but unfortunately, yeah. our wonderful chairman of the Security Exchange Commission, which actually taught cryptocurrency at MIT and said, and I quote, that 
50% of all digital assets are commodities, not securities. And now he's saying all of them are securities and need to register without giving any anecdotal proof and reason well, why. It, and then let's pick them off one by one. First of all, I think you're probably agreeing that's a handful of them. Maybe it's your top 10 that, that you would you would want to hold in a portfolio anyway, right? Sure. I mean, and, and I'm fine okay. with them adapting. Let's, let's, let's so just let's, call it a security. What I just can't fathom. And John, I think you would agree. If, if I was to tell you, John, I'm going to sit you in a, a closed room environment with a chief regulator for the SEC, a chief regulator for the commodity uh, CFTC. I'm going to bring in a university professor from MIT, a university professor from Harvard, and a university professor from pick any school you want on economics. And I say, you guys have six hours. At the end of six hours, I want a clear, decisive list of what is a security, what are the qualifiers, so I can look at any crypto and say, yep, this is a stamp approval security, or this is a commodity, or this is none of the above. Do you think you could accomplish that in six hours with that team? Yeah, I think I could. So, so how in the hell has it taken Gary Gensler over two years in office, because having done 55 enforcement actions against digital asset right. companies, and he still cannot say that any one specific crypto is a security or not? Who's who's Gensler's boss? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I'm telling you, I Joe know. Biden doesn't like cryptos. I know. And he and he's carrying the water bucket for Joe Biden, and he's dragging his feet, and uh, he's gaslighting it, and he's doing Joe Biden's bidding. I mean, yeah. Come on, Co Coach. That's what he's doing. Yeah. No, he, he's he's it's absolutely right. And and I saw the testimony that happened and, a couple and, weeks back, which is and, absolutely and, awesome. And, and by the way, it's political. Yeah. It's political. Totally. It, you know, totally. It'll change soon, John. It'll change in the election. Mark my words. All right, John. I got to wrap up because they're going to be like another really lengthy show here. I, I try to keep these shows short, but we just can't seem to do that, can we? <laughs> Merlin, going back to power trading radio, we. But at least in this format, Marlon, you and I seem to agree a little bit more. I'm getting worried, worried, whoa, worried whoa, about. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I agreed with you on quite a few things in the past. Quite a few, quite a few. I like to, I like to object yeah. just to get you fired up. Yeah, you know, forty percent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, on, hey, on a on a good day, and it was a it was a Friday it, afternoon. It was a know, Friday, yeah. and I was about to go to happy yeah. hour. So sure, sure, that's a good day. Um, all right, my friend. Well, hey, thank you very much. Uh, I will. Uh, I look all forward right. to see what happens with this debt ceiling crisis, which we should be. We should have some uh, decisions here in the next few few days to weeks. But uh, it'll be interesting to see which of those five options they go down. I think it's going to be kick the can down the road. But uh, next time, let's get you on the program. Talk about digital assets. I think that might be fun to explore that a little bit That's deeper good. than we did today. Peace. I'm out of here. All right. Take care, John. All right, that was John O'Donnell. I like to call him the ambassador of opportunity. I've known him for oh so many. It's in 1998 I've known John and uh, just a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge, and all-around good guy. A um, couple things here. Um, ch -ch -ch -ch. Koja, you said it could, be, it could be 2070 after mining the last Bitcoin. The last Bitcoin will be mined in 2140. That It's on a schedule. The last Bitcoin will officially be mined in 2140. So we got plenty of time before that happens. Um, and Koja says, if it's a security or a commodity, it's a win for crypto. Absolutely. It really is. It's just about clarity, right? Let, let me know what they are. Like, imagine that you had to pay taxes on your vehicle. But if it was a car, you had to pay taxes. But if it was an auto, you didn't have to pay taxes. But nobody gave you a clear distinction on if, if my vehicle is a car or an auto, what, what is it? Am I, which, which category am I in? And that's the job of the transportation department to say, okay, this would make you a car. This would make you an auto. That's the same argument for crypto. You have this colossally inept Gary Gensler, who I agree with John, is being pushed by the current administration to go after crypto. There's no way on earth it should take that long to come up with this decision on what it is, a, um, a security or a commodity. And yeah, we are at an hour show. Damn nabbit. I have so much else to do. Big Ed said, sold AMD and XLE puts today. I sold XLE puts today too. That, uh, boy, I thought it was doing well and it started ripping up. I sold it this morning. Let me go back to XLE today. Um, I sold the 76s. So I was down, I'm down here. But uh, boy, the way it just fell apart near the end of the session today did not look good. I'll bring this up on a five minute time frame here so you guys can see that. It was really ugly that last 
hour or so of the market. Um, sold them this afternoon, started rallying up. I thought, great, great, great. And then all of a sudden just came screaming down and down another 0.43% in the after hour. So we could see some pain out there. Notice lots of red on the ETF indexes or, or market segment ETFs here. You can see across the board, energy, uh, the worst performer out there today. At one point, it was actually looking really good and then just fell apart. So I did sell for the 19th. Uh, the 76. Oh, you did the 74s. Probably a, a, a safer way to go. I was getting a little bit greedy, but um, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. If I get put at 76, I'll sell calls against it. I See, with XLE, I don't need to worry about it going bankrupt as I did with FRC. Uh, even, you know, when I got my JP Morgan or Bank of America shares, sold calls against it. Ultimately, I was down underwater for a while on those, and then at the end of it, made a nice chunk of change based off those moves. So, uh, yeah, I'm okay owning at 76, and I'll just sell calls against it. All right, uh, let me, I didn't really do anything from a prep perspective. So let's go real quick and look at uh, tomorrow, because we do have a popcorn trade of the day. I know all eyes are focused on what's going on with the Federal Reserve and the 25 basis point increase. I was so busy today, I did not get a chance to listen to the press conference, as I always do. So I'm going to probably listen to that tonight, just because I, I love listening to what Jerome Powell does and how he squirms at those meetings. But tomorrow, we do have a popcorn trade of the day, and that, my friends, will be Apple, the second most influential company. Some would argue the most influential. Uh, aftermarket close is really a biggie. You've got Apple, you've got Square or Block, you've got uh, Turtle Beach, Shopify, but you also have PG&E, um, Bausch Health, Westrock, and a few others. Let me see if I got some bigger names on there. Uh, Swisscom and Shell, Shell reporting, and ConocoPhillips, Anheuser-Busch. This is one that normally I don't follow at all, Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser, but I'm really curious to see what the fallout is from their ad campaign. It really is kind of humorous to me to step back and watch all the, the craziness that's going on uh, at Budweiser, specifically because of the Bud, Bud Light ad campaign that they did. Uh, I have a feeling this is going to really just kick Anheuser-Busch in the teeth. You know, you, I think one thing that's important about business is you got to know your audience. And I think we would all agree that if I had a list of character pictures of people and said, here's Bud Light, which one of these people would be drinking Bud Light? It's probably fairly easy to pinpoint that's a Bud Light drinker, right? You know, we can profile and do all that because Bud Light has built for decades this reputation of I'm a redneck beer, right? I'm a country beer. I, it's all sponsoring concerts and country events. I, I'm fine with Bud Light. I'm just, Bud Light is basically just water, but Bud Light, Coors Light, sure, I'll have those when I'm really thirsty, but not a good quality beer. Then all of a sudden you change your target marketing and backlash from your diehard Fans, I mean, watching watching Cowboys just dump out cases of Coors Light or, or sorry, Bud Light, or sit there with their AR-15 shooting pallets of beer that they just want to throw away just cracks me up. So uh, Anheuser Busch would be a really interesting one with their earnings. That's going to happen before market open, but probably not. Gonna, let me see what has Budweiser done. I haven't looked at their chart in a long time since I don't really trade Anheuser Busch. But let's go look at Bud B U D, and we'll go on a daily here so we can see what's been happening. Well, really hasn't had much of an impact. I actually thought there'd be more of a fallout here and just kind of selling off. So I'll keep an eye on that one. Anheuser-Busch, InBev for tomorrow. Remember, it's not just Anheuser-Busch. InBev is huge. There's a ton of other uh, brands there. Koja, thank you very much for the uh, contribution. I do appreciate it. I always love that. Uh, so that's your earnings. Let's go to Forex Factory here so you can see the economic calendar because we have another rate statement coming out tomorrow. That's going to be at 3.15 a.m., that's right, Pacific time. They're looking to raise 25 basis points for the euro as well. Their main refinance rate going from 3.5% expected to jump to 3.75. Now, as far as U.S. economic announcements, we do have natural gas storage, which got slaughtered yet again today. Natural gas is just unbelievable chart going lower and lower and lower. You also have unemployment claims, preliminary non-farm productivity and labor costs tomorrow, as well as the U.S. trade balance. So that is pretty much it for your big economic announcements. I guess the last one on here is going to be uh, the euro. They have a producer price index number, so PPI, inflationary data. Big F says they will rebuild their marketing department. I think, yeah, I actually read an article that they fired some of the chief execs that signed off on that campaign. But yeah, they'll, they'll get back. It's just, it's kind of silly how it all went down. Merlin, can you look into the concept of Go woke, go bro question. Is there truth there or just political views? Uh, I try to stay away from that. I really like what Elon Musk had to say. He was on uh, Bill Maher the other day. If you didn't get to see it, I thought that was pretty good. Um, but yeah, this whole woke, woke virus really is just kind of getting out of hand. Um, but yeah, I won't say go woke, go broke. I'll, I'll leave that one alone. 
It happens. Major stores closing and leaving large cities. Uh, yes. So we talked about that, John, a little bit on my big concern. And we talked about this a month or so ago was commercial real estate. I think that's the next piece that's really going to be the catalyst for market declines. And I'm already bearish to begin with based off of just interest rate hikes. Um, get a commercial real estate fall apart and more banks defaulting. We could put ourselves in a much bigger downside move here. Boil at 280. I know that thing's going to be at a buck here soon. Housers. All right, that's going to do it for me. We did the economic calendar. I got you earnings information as well. We're going to have Bill Addis on the show for tomorrow. So we'll talk, we're going to talk all about Federal Reserve. We'll talk about Jerome Powell, what was said today, what he sees uh, market wise going forward. We'll talk about I bonds and new repricing the I bonds, which has dropped. So if you guys have any comments, questions, feedback, you can email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com or put them down below any of the YouTube videos. Until then, happy trading, everybody. I will see you tomorrow. Yeah.